Hey and welcome back. There seems to be two breaking science stories in the news right now. I wasn't quite sure which to do, so we'll do both. The first is really intriguing and it is brilliant doing research for you to find out what really was the Carrington event. Now you're all really smart, so you'll know it's a coronal mass ejection that causes an EMP surge. What exactly is that? Well, our star, the Sun, is a giant ball of electromagnetic activity and it can burst out and send flares out into its solar system. And you don't want to be hit by one of these they tend to knock out electronic equipment, even electromechanical equipment. Computers fried. And they happen all the time. But how dangerous they are depends on when in our orbit the sun blasts it out. And if it's going to whoop, miss Earth or whoop, bonk, hit Earth. And that happens on the 1st of September, 1859. The Carrington event. Why is it Carrington? Well, it was named after Richard Carrington. Richard was a British astronomer who worked from home. Look at this amazing place he lived in just south of London with that dome on the roof. Lucky Richard. And Richard was measuring sunspot activities and he noticed a few days before his synonymous event that the sun produced a large amount of activity. You could actually see it with the naked eye. There were some very big sunspots and he did this drawing. What he saw occurred just at the end of August. And then on the 1st of September, kaboom. This coronial mass ejection hits the Earth smack on. Luckily, it was 1859. <laughs> One of the most high-tech devices we had in 1859 was the telegraph, and it reaped havoc. There's some brilliant reports written by telegraph operators saying that they got an electric shock off their keying key, and even the paper tape caught fire due to this magnetic pulse that was in the transmission lines between telegraph stations. One operator said it was so scary they disconnected the batteries that make the system work and it could still send a message. No, that was amazing. And one of my favorite stories, it was the gold rush and gold diggers in California who were fast asleep woke up thinking it was morning and made coffee and it was not morning. It was this immense aurora that was glowing over their camp. And it was actually three o'clock in the morning. And these aurora were seen all over our world. There's reports of them being seen as far south as Florida. This was a massive event. And they happen all the time. It's just a matter of Russian roulette whether when they fire there's a bullet with our name on it. The effects would be devastating to satellites, to all computers, to cars, to general infrastructure. And there's a very specific defense worry because communication would be cut off because EMP, electromagnetic pulse, is also a secondary effect of a nuclear explosion. In fact, I think you can make atomic weapons that predominantly make EMP pulses to knock out 
your opponent's electronics, it might put us on a World War III footing. People not realizing it was actually our sun bursting energy towards our Earth might think they've been attacked and press the nuclear launch button. I certainly hope not. And we rely so much on computer control equipment for our infrastructure, water, power, and even power stations. Imagine a nuclear power station that lost all its controls. Serious matter. So I looked up on the interweb to see what people were doing if an EMP or a new Carrington style event happened. And what I found was rather sad. Now it's good to be prepared. It's even good to be a prepper, but I don't think putting your cell phone in the microwave oven is really going to help because who else is going to phone you? So that's fascinating. But there's another science story that's in the news this week, and that's room temperature superconductivity has been achieved for the first time. And that's brilliant and really important. So again, I got to research superconductivity, and it's cool stuff. The media often shows us pictures of levitating magnets and lossless transmission lines are a thing that's been sold to us. But I wanted to deep dive into what is superconductivity? And it's a can of worms and fascinating. So here goes, thanks to you, I get to research the ins and outs of superconductivity. Well, it turns out that it's a quantum effect, something that happens on the very, very small scale. Superconductivity is in fact really old. It was first observed in 1911, where scientists saw that electrons produce vibrations in a metal's atomic lattice. These draw the electrons down together into what's known as a Cooper pair. And when these electrons are paired in the quantum world, they can apparently flow unimpeded through the metallic structure of a wire or material. That means no resistance. And you have to understand that one of the biggest losses in, say, power transmission is the resistance of the wire itself. And that's been a problem for green energy. If you've got distant wind or solar farms that need to be connected by long wires to the grid, the losses in those wires have to be taken into consideration. A superconductive wire transmission system would be amazing. But there's a problem. Superconductivity only occurs at around absolute zero. But it turns out that superconductivity is occurring at warmer and warmer temperatures. The holy grail of superconductivity is a room temperature effect. And this month, these scientists think they've cracked it. And it's so funny because some of the team is British and they say the room temperature is about 59 degrees, you know, a chilly 15 Celsius. And I think that's hilarious because that's rather a cold British living room temperature. Anyway, using exotic materials, hydrogen, carbon, and a few doping elements, they have managed to have a superconductivity effect in a British chilly living room. But there's an issue. The issue is, it only occurs under extreme pressure, and I'm talking extreme. Their test samples only enter the world of superconductivity 
when crushed together between these two diamond anvils. But the brushes are enormous and so's the cost. It turns out that they've smashed quite a few of these diamond anvil pairs. And one of the scientists said, we're running out of our diamond budget. So I can't wait for superconductivity to work at proper room temperatures without the crushing force of diamonds. And maybe one day it will. Maglev trains, lossless electricity transmission would be fantastic. But for now, it's only happening in a chilly British living room crushed by diamonds. <laughs> the truth is out there. Stay tuned for more breaking science on the Professor Simon channel and you might enjoy this film.